Um, thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation to speak here. It's the first uh, interest conference I've been to and I've really, really enjoyed it. Um, so I'm hoping I get invited back. That's a plug from the podium. Um, I'm, I'm not a, a vaccine trialist at all. I'm a basic scientist, I'm a virologist, and so a lot of, it's, this is going to be a very different type of talk to what you've just heard from Hannah, and I'm going to try to link together uh, what is happening and what has happened in the HIV vaccine trials to what is happening in the basic science arena and, and maybe describe some of the possibilities. But I guess what's really struck me sitting over the last couple of days is that my world is quite different to most of your world. Um, you guys are, most of you, many of you, I think, in this room, really dealing with the here and now. You're in the trenches. And it must seem to you that an HIV vaccine is far, far down the road. And that's probably not untrue. But I think what's also struck me is that listening to the challenges that many of you are facing, it seems to me that the need for a vaccine becomes even more compelling. I think the reasons for that are many and obvious, but one of the, one of the greatest ones is that despite the incredible effort that many of you put into treatment of HIV-infected people, there's still a huge gap, and as I learned here, particularly in children. And in contrast, vaccines are very safe, contrary to what you hear sometimes in the press. They don't rely on adherence or behavior modification, and they, they generally provide lifelong protection, and that's a very appealing concept, and they've worked very well. They've been one of the best, historically, one of the best medical interventions we have. But it is very, very difficult to make an HIV vaccine, and that's for many reasons. We don't have a correlative protection. Nobody's ever recovered from HIV infection. Because HIV integrates directly into the human DNA, we, I believe we need sterilizing immunity. We need a vaccine that prevents infection from ever happening. HIV causes huge immune uh, system dysfunction. It's highly variable with multiple subtypes and what we call CRFs, or circulating recombinant forms, where subtypes that we've defined intermingle with one another to create almost a continuum of viral diversity. I mean, the viral diversity we see in HIV makes the diversity you see in flu pale into insignificance, and we know we need an annual vaccine for flu, so it's a massive challenge. The animal models for testing vaccines are suboptimal, and the antibody neutralization sensitive sites so that are, are, are recessed conformational and covered in sugars, and what that means is that the parts of the, of the HIV that would be sensitive, we would hope, to neutralizing antibodies, which are the kinds of antibodies that bind to the virus and stop it from infecting your cell, are extremely well hidden. But despite that, there has, as you heard from Hannah, been a glimmer of hope in the last few years with the RV144 vaccine trial that showed some efficacy, um, to the surprise of many of us in the field, 31% um, efficacy. Um, you can see from those, these two graphs that um, RV144 was associated with a 31% protection from infection, but no change in viral load. And those two findings together suggested that it was an antibody response that was protecting some people from infection, rather than a CD8 response that was uh, affecting viral load after infection. And indeed, that turned out to be the case. A huge amount of effort, and I'll show you a little bit more of this on the next slide, went in to try to understand what happened in RV144, RV144 and ask what the protective mechanism was. Um, and as you've already heard, two correlates of risk were identified, but importantly, neither of these were neutralizing antibodies. And, and the reason I raise this is that many vaccines are thought, sometimes without very much evidence, but many vaccines are thought to work by neutralizing antibodies, those antibodies I mentioned that stop the virus from infecting. In RV144, there was no evidence that neutralizing antibodies played a role in protection. It turned out that it was IgG antibodies that bound to V1, V2, which is simply an epitope that we talk a lot about in HIV. Um, that were associated with protection, so you see high responses in the purple curve are lower than the placebo. And then IgA antibodies uh, were inversely correlated with protection, so high, high, levels, high levels of IgA was not a good thing. So we had these two correlates of protection. It was an incredible, especially for somebody who's not involved in this field, an incredible effort from many, many people across, across the world to try to decipher this in more detail. And I think there's now quite strong evidence that the GP120, V1, V2 binding antibodies are a real correlative risk. We've seen several studies now that correlate, that corroborate the initial studies that showed high binding responses to V1, V2. We've also seen V1, V2, IgG3 responses and FC effector functions were higher in RV144 than a previous trial, VAX003, that did not use the same regimen. We've also seen the isolation of monoclonal antibodies from RV144 volunteers that mediated ADCC, antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. And we've also seen the sieve analysis that supports the fact that some of the viruses that managed to get through the vaccine uh, had pressure at the, in V1, V2. 
But the reason I've highlighted um, some of these in red is I think that the, one of the significant outputs from RV144 is it really got us to consider the other end of the antibody, for those of you who know antibodies, to think about effector functions and what are frequently termed non-neutralizing functions, other functions that antibodies have that have probably been under, under thought over the last few years. And so I think it's really got us to reconsider what we what kind of functions of antibodies we need to be measuring and get us to think way beyond neutralization, which is where many of the assays stopped, and look at HIV inhibition at mucosal surfaces and look at the effects of antibodies in aggregation, mucus trapping, and transcytosis, and many other effects of functions. I think that has really been a fundamental shift in the way we evaluate uh, vaccines. Hannah showed you the slide, but I think for me, what I want to focus is, is, is this track, is the fact that we now have built on RV144, built on the findings that have um, come out of that trial so far, we have a research track which looks to assess the different effects of adjuvants, different primes, different boosts, look at the durability of responses, the effect of virus subtype, um, and importantly, effector responses and mucosal responses. And I think it's exciting that um, the vaccine field is now moving towards a more um, adaptable uh, research approach to looking at what works and what doesn't work. So I think there are reasons for optimism in that vaccination, for the first time, we we've been able to say that vaccination can alter the risk of acquiring infection, and certainly identifying correlates gives us lots of opportunities for improving on that. But I do think that a, a better vaccine, and 31% is clearly not good enough, a better vaccine may well require the induction of neutralizing antibodies, which you might gather are something of my passion, so you're going to hear a lot more about them. So I, I'm, I'm going to give you a whole, I'm kind of cherry-picked a whole lot of big concepts that have come out in the field over the last couple of years, and I'm going to try and talk you through some of the big concepts, and in many cases, I'm not showing you the data, I'm trying to summarize what the big issues are. Um, but I thought it was important to first define what we mean by broadly neutralizing antibodies. So everybody who's infected with HIV uh, develops neutralizing antibodies, but in most cases, these are what we term strain-specific, so my antibodies would only neutralize my virus. Some people, however, develop broadly neutralizing antibodies, in which case my antibodies would be able to neutralize all of your viruses. So in terms of what's useful for a vaccine, and this is a slide my student made, so don't hold me responsible. These are the kinds of antibodies we probably do want. These types of antibodies are a whole lot less useful. For a long time, we thought that broadly neutralizing antibodies were only made by very few people. Um, but it turns out, and actually we've known this for a long time, but we've probably not appreciated the significance of it. It turns out that virtually everybody who's infected with HIV can make some level of cross-neutralizing antibodies. So this is um, a, a slide that shows you the neutralizing capacity of serum from hundreds of HIV-infected people. And the point I want you to get is that 50% of infected people develop antibodies that can neutralize 50% of viruses. So this is not a, as rare an event as we once thought. It turns out that actually the immune system is quite good at making broadly neutralizing antibodies with the caveat that this takes many years. These are chronically infected individuals. But I think that's an encouraging thing. The other thing we know, and I've just put up one study here, but there are many studies showing here this, is that broadly neutralizing antibodies can prevent HIV in, um, infection in animal models. This is um, showing you panels A, B, and C in the absence of a pointer. Panels A, B, and C show you what happens when you administer one of these broadly neutralizing antibodies, which we call PGT-121, to animals before you challenge them with, if, with a shiv, with a simian version of HIV. And you can see that at five mg per kg in the blue and one mg per kg, all the animals were protected from infection. And even at 0.2 mg per kg, there was fairly good protection. And you contrast that to what happens when you give an anti-dengue antibody in red, you can see there's no protection. So we know they work in animals. We don't yet know they work in humans. We also know a lot about um, where the antibodies bind and what the viral vulnerabilities are. And this is really work that's come together hugely in the last few years. In the last couple of years, we've obtained the structure of the native prefusion HIV envelope trimer. All that means is that if you consider the HIV virus, you know it's an envelope virus and it's got, um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's got the lipid bilayer and it has little envelope proteins lining that. And those are the, um, the envelope proteins what the virus uses to enter cells. For the first time, what we have in the last two years is a crystal structure of that envelope trimer. It was hard to get because it's a very wobbly protein. Um, and the availability of this BG505 um, envelope trimer, which is a much more stable, rigid protein, uh, 
is thought by many in the field to open up huge possibilities for better immune engine design. So the fact that it was stable enough for us to be able to get a crystal structure, to me this is just a blob, I have to be honest. But to people who are, work in the field, this is a very exciting thing. We now know what the target, target looks like. And the fact that it was stable enough for us to be able to get a crystal structure means that it might be a more rigid version of the envelope protein than others, and that might make it a better immunogen. So there's a huge amount of activity in this field. We also know a lot more than we did a few years ago about conserved epitopes. So I've already mentioned the huge viral diversity we see with HIV, and I think it's kind of represented here. If you look at all of these, all of these pictures, they're, they're all human faces. You know they're all human faces, but there are conserved elements to those faces that make them human faces. And the same is true with HIV. There are conserved elements of the envelope protein that cannot change for various reasons. And we know a lot about them. So this is another view of that envelope protein that sits on the outside of the virus particle and is the target of antibodies. And I've colored here all the vulnerable parts of that envelope. And you can see that actually there are a lot of vulnerabilities on the, on the viral spike on the envelope protein. It turns out there are at least five. And it turns out that many of them are very immunogenic. So if you follow chronically infected people for many years, they'll develop antibodies to these sites in many cases. If you look at the, um, the red blob at the top, that's the V1, V2 region, which is the site that the RV144 vaccine targets. But actually, if you look at infected people, as many of a as a third of them can develop antibodies to these sites. So they're highly immunogenic. They develop very commonly, and that makes them appealing from a vaccine perspective. The other thing we've learned a huge amount about is what these broadly neutralizing antibodies look like. I hope you can see the purple better than I can see the purple. We know now that HIV broadly neutralizing antibodies have unusual genetic and physical properties, and I've tried to summarize a lot of work into this slide. So if you look at the antibody on the left, the ancestor antibody, this is a schematic version of what an ancestor antibody looks like. This is what an antibody looks like when it's born. What we know about broadly neutralizing antibodies is that they're either highly mutated away from their ancestor. In other words, they've evolved over many years and picked up a whole bunch of mutations, and they're as much as 30% different from what they looked like when they were born. That's a process of somatic hypermutation, it takes a long time, and we know that many of the broadly neutralizing antibodies have all of these mutations. If you look at the bottom, there are other antibodies that have these long CDH3s. The CDH3 is just part of the antibody that in, in the case of anti-HIV antibodies is necessary to reach through the viral defenses and kind of grab the vulnerable bits of the, of the envelope protein. But we know that many of the antibodies, particularly to V2, have these incredibly long CDH3s. So these antibodies are unusual, they've been referred to as freaks of nature. It's only really in the last two years that we've understood how that happens. Um, so been a, there's been a lot of effort put into understanding how they get that way. In terms of the antibodies that are highly mutated away from the ancestor antibody, it turns out that, unsurprisingly, this is a very long process that takes many years in exposure, and it's, it's a consequence of exposure to a chronic viral infection with many variants over time. And you can see I've given it a kind of a, a wiggly line because it's a very random process and one of the, you know, they, the antibodies pick up mutations constantly, some of them are useful, some of them are not. But the overall take home message, I guess, from this is that antibodies that are as far as 30% mutated away from the ancestor antibody would be hard to achieve through vaccination. With vaccination, we can maybe drive antibodies 5 or 10% down the line, but to get them all the way to 30% would be hard. What about the antibodies with the long CDH3s? This is um, work we published last year that shows that in fact those long CDH3s aren't a gradual kind of growth where the antibody gets longer and longer arms as it needs to see the virus. These antibodies are born with long CDH3s. The ancestor antibody has them. It's fo they formed as part of the initial IgG recombination event. Breadth then comes very, very well, comes through more moderate levels of mutation and that has the potential to shortcut the process from years down to weeks, um, which is exciting from a vaccine perspective. So if you think about which of those two pathways, because we only have two pathways, believe it or not, after all, this year of, after all these years of studying um, broadly neutralizing antibodies, we really only know about these two pathways. Which pathway would be more amenable to HIV vaccine design? So these antibodies with the long arms, um, although they're, they're, they're born with these long CDRH3s, the problem is that B cells that the, the B cells that express the ancestor antibody that have these long CDIH3s are associated with autoreactivity. So they're frequently deleted, they're rare in the naive B, B cell repertoire. So to be able to fish those precursors out would be challenging. In contrast, the antibodies, uh, the CD4 binding site antibodies, for example, that have this high level of somatic hypermutation, 
don't have this requirement for that rare long B, uh, CDRH3. But these kinds of antibodies may only be able to use a select set of immunoglobulin genes, and that may limit um, the starting material, if you like, in the immune system. The advantage of the V2 antibodies that have the long CDRH3s, as I said, is that they can develop within months, not years, if, if you can pick the right precursor up, whereas these guys need high levels of affinity maturation that may be hard to achieve through vaccination. So neither of these two pathways are particularly amenable to vaccine design. With the uh, um, long CDRH3s, it would be a challenge to pick up those rare B cells that have the right starting material, whereas with um, particularly the CD4 binding site antibodies, to drive them along that path, it will be a challenge. How they got along that path is, as I said, through uh, exposure to, to lots of viruses. So you have somebody who's infected with HIV. They develop antibodies. As I said, everybody develops strain-specific antibodies. The virus escapes. Doug Richmond showed this years ago. But I think what's become clearer is that after the virus escapes, the antibodies change to deal with the new virus, and then the virus changes again, and then the antibodies change again. And it's a continual arms race going on as a consequence of exposure to a, a highly replicating virus that's changing as well. And in some cases, this leads to the development of breath. So one of the big concepts that I think people are discussing in the HIV vaccine field is whether, in order to drive those very mutated antibodies, whether we're going to need to mimic this. So whether we're going to need to come up with what are called sequential immunization strategies that are designed to mimic that process of viral evolution that happens in infected people and that can result in the development of breath. And some of these studies are, are already underway. And the feasibility of these kinds of studies in a real-world situation is something else we can discuss. So, overall, there's been, a, I think, just within the broadly neutralizing antibody sphere, there's been a huge amount of activity, and it's, it's got some very direct translations for vaccine strategies. We've now got these envelope trimers that are designed, that can be designed, we hope, to elicit broadly neutralizing antibodies, though that's still in process. The fact that we know now what the viral targets are, what the vulnerabilities are, means that we can design epitope-based vaccines. So we know V1V2 is a frequent target. We can scaffold V1V2 onto other structures and present just the bit that we care about to the immune system, and there's a lot of work going on there. Vaccine strategies that are aimed to bind what we call germline ancestors. This is this idea that you would need to come up with a very clever immunogen that can fish out those rare B cells that have, have the long CDOH3s and pull the needle out of the haystack and, and start the um, immune response along the right pathway. And there's a lot going on there, trying to understand what kind of viral immunogens would be the best for pulling out those very rare B cells. And then, as I've mentioned, sequential immunization strategies to, to mimic viral evolution and drive antibody maturation towards breath. Of course, another big conversation that's been happening in, in the HIV vaccine world is passive immunization. Um, so with active vaccination, we're giving the body um, a vaccine and we're asking the immune system to do the work. That's not yet resulted in broadly neutralizing antibodies, as you're all aware. But because we have all these HIV-infected people who have made these incredibly good antibodies and because the technology has evolved over the last kind of years, we can now fish those antibodies out and create monoclonal antibodies that have extraordinary breadth and potency. Some of the more recently isolated antibodies can neutralize 98% of global viruses with absolutely minute amounts. They're incredible antibodies. So passive immunization would be a case of taking those antibodies and giving them directly to, to people as drugs, in a sense, rather than an active vaccination approach. There are many precedents for use of monoclonal antibodies in the clinic. I'm just showing you one here because this is an, another infectious disease. It's synagis is an antibody already used in the clinic uh, to prevent a serious lung disease called bio, caused by RSV. It's used in infants at high risk because of prematurity or congenital heart disease, and it's dosed once a month for the duration of the RSV season. And the reason I tell you this is to get you to think about how practical passive immunization would be. I think it has a ton of promise, passive immunization, but it's also slightly depressing because it's plan B, right? Plan A would be an HIV vaccine where the immune system would do the work. We haven't managed to do that, so plan B is passive immunization. These kinds of studies have already started. Um, these are small studies in uninfected and HIV-infected humans with monoclonal antibodies um, targeting the CD4 binding site, VRCO1 and 3BNC, 3BNC117. They have ridiculous names, these antibodies. Have already gone into humans, and they're they're, they're, people are looking at safety and looking at the effects on, on viral loads. And the others are planned. I think PGT-121 and 101074 may already have gone into humans. But large-scale efficacy trials, will, although planned, will only give results in 2020. So again, a long time away. <laughs>
The promise of this approach is that it, it will provide for the first time proof of principle that broadly neutralizing antibodies can prevent HIV infection. I've shown you that we can do that in animals, but actually we still don't know whether that'll work in humans. I'm sure it will work, but we should show it. Um, but more importantly, it, gets to, it, it allows us to answer more basic questions, such as how much antibody we, do we need, and particularly how much antibody do we need at mucosal surfaces? What's the best viral epitope? I showed you that there are lots of them. Are some better than others? What's the importance of antibody isotypes and other effective functions, and can we identify additional correlates of protection? All of this would be very useful, but it's certainly not a shortcut to an HIV vaccine because the caveats with these kinds of trials is that passive immunization will be testing the role of neutralizing antibodies in the absence of any other vaccine immune responses. It's not a real situation. It's not a, it's, it's not a mimic of a vaccination response. It won't provide information on the immunological roadblocks to inducing broadly neutralizing antibodies. Efficacy data will not be available for a number of years. And I think, importantly, the prospects for using broadly neutralizing antibodies pre for prevention or for treatment, because both arms are being considered, still needs to be assessed, and there are huge challenges, as you can imagine. Okay, and there, I'll stop wittering on about antibodies and try to take a step back and, and put it into a bit more context, which is that obviously the immune system acts in, in concert. And a vaccine would ideally need to elicit both broadly neutralizing antibodies, which I'm a huge fan of, but also cross-reactive T cells. Mosaics and ancestral approaches, there are many of these, in, and I'm not going to get into them, that attempt to use a kind of an artificial bioinformatically constructed um, immunogen that contains as many viral vulnerabilities as you can squeeze onto a molecule. Um, and those have been traditionally designed to focus the immune response onto T cell epitopes, but increasingly are being used for antibody responses as well. Um, we need to know hugely more about what the optimal vaccine vectors are, and I think particularly replicating vectors. And again, replicating vectors have mostly been discussed up to now, I think, in the arena of T cells. But given what we know about broadly neutralizing antibodies and the fact that it takes years and years and years, I'm pretty sure we're gonna need a replicating vector for antibody responses too. And then finally, also adjuvants, and then finally CD4 responses, which are needed for both the CD8 responses and the neutralizing antibody responses. So, so while I've focused my talk mostly on, on big breakthroughs that have happened recently in the neutralizing antibody field, I don't want you to think that that's happening in isolation. I do think that we have more evidence than we've ever had before that an HIV vaccine is an achievable goal, but it's certainly not around the corner. It's still years away. RV144 has provided immune correlates that are being pursued by the P5, as you heard, and by many others. Um, Studies in HIV infection, particularly in HIV-infected people who naturally make broadly neutralizing antibodies, have identified critical factors in their induction. But there are still huge challenges in translating those into an HIV vaccine. And important new advances in the design of novel immunogens and vaccine approaches do, I think, including passive immunization, hold promise for eliciting improved protective antibody responses. I'm gonna stop there and thank um, the bunch of reprobates that I work with who are shown in this photo here. Um, this is the NICD HRV antibody group, which I co-direct with Lynn Morris, and then you can see many, uh, many funders and collaborators, many of whom have informed the way we think about the work that we do in South Africa, and I thank you.